often I'm asked, which sword is best? The answer is clear and certainly not a jest. It's the one you have ready to wield in the fight. Doesn't matter which one, as long as it can bite. Awesome. A massive welcome to Lauren Danger Shaw, HEMA and Ambassador, historical European martial arts teacher, primarily in medieval weaponry. Uh, medieval, some Renaissance, and a little bit of Victorian as well. Wow, wow, excellent. And you're someone, well, who's got a wide range of knowledge behind the arts that you're teaching, as well as someone that can perform and teach them, which I think is quite nice and not normally what you find in martial arts. Normally you find maybe a teacher that's good at what they actually doing it, but maybe they can't teach. Or you find someone who's good at teaching, but maybe they can't perform it or doesn't have the knowledge of the history behind it. So you're offering quite a complete sort of package, which I think is quite nice. Oh, thank you. Um, I like the show, don't tell philosophy. So if you're going to teach, you should be able to show someone and then watch them and then be able to really refine their movements. And when you're dealing with whether, you know, when I studied jujitsu, I had some pretty good instructors who were like that and that helped me to develop. So when I switched into HEMA, uh, I really got um, that idea that, you know, if you want to eventually teach it, then doing the research, knowing what's in the manuals, and it's a bit more than just saying, oh, okay, I'm good at sparring in a fight and I can win. How'd you do it? I don't know. Mm -hmm. You should know because you need to really build those steps and proper technique it means that you avoid injury. I mean, if you're going to hurt yourself because you don't do the technique properly, but you do it all at full power and lots of speed and you just want to win and then you're injured, then you can't enjoy it. So there's a real progression that you have to do. And if you're, be, if you're an instructor in any way, you have a responsibility to look after your students. You want to make sure that they stay healthy. So teaching them the right way and making sure that you're learning it yourself the right way so that you can show it, it's important. Sure, for sure. Would you be able to give our viewers a bit more of your journey, how it started, how you progressed into weaponry? And um, yeah, just tell us a bit about that, please. Well, um, when I was 18, I studied karate. Um, you know, you should learn self-defense, you know, as a young lady, you should, you know, at least be able to know how to throw a punch or something so you can run away. And then for, I don't know, a lot of years, I just drifted away from it. The martial arts and in my 30s I started studying jiu-jitsu and I had a lot of fun with that for almost two years but it started the MMA was really you know taking off and you ended up in a club with a lot of people that oh yeah you know you know, all these guys who want to you know go and test themselves and stuff and the atmosphere was really changing so I wanted something different my sister said you should pick up sword fighting you've always liked swords I was like Oh, yeah, well, how do you do that? She's like, I found you a place. And so I joined a local club, and that was 10 years ago. And just, you know, just learning, and we did different styles, and we would switch, and we would do medieval longsword. Mm -hmm. We did rapier, we did staff, we did pole weapons, we did a little bit of wrestling and grappling, and it was all based on actual manuals. And I thought it was fascinating that there was something written down that you could go and look and see techniques and have descriptions of them and see drawings and that this was you know five six hundred years old mm -hmm. and eventually a bunch of us we started our own club um almost two years ago now and uh you know i was helping teach before that but in our new club i'm now the introductory instructor mm -hmm. and so when we take in new students i'm the one that they get to meet cool so Regarding HEMA as well, I was chatting to one of my friends and they were saying that part of the knowledge of the fighting was kind of lost and then it's been rediscovered and kind of put back together. Is this correct? Um, that's a lot of that is true. Um, what happens is as you get through the 19th into the 20th century, um, we get a lot of more sporting contacts and things evolve into from from more of historical a need to defend yourself into a lot more olympic fencing which is mm -hmm. fantastic and requires a lot of ability a lot of high speed 
uh, but there are a lot of rules and mm. a fight on a battlefield or you know a skirmish on the road is very different from a one-on-one -on -one competition for scoring points so a lot of this it kind of just gets forgotten it's not purposely lost but then people start looking at manuals and manuals are being restored and you know you start and things are relocated and people are translating them because a lot of the stuff whether it's in a medieval latin or high german or uh, you know italian or spanish people are starting to then translate them so as we get into the 1990s and early 2000s people have that interest again and they're they're sharing their translations and that really kind of sparks the interest again and is that one of the key aspects that kind of drew you into it more that you can kind of research it that you're kind of having to look at these manuals and you're not yes. just having someone tell you yes um so you can buy <laughs> you know a copy uh -huh. you can buy something and it'll have a translation it'll have you know copies of the original drawings oh, and cool. dope wrestling techniques for example mm -hmm. this is a Talhofer 1467 copy and it's got various weapons and fighting and so you can pick it up you can look at it it's not just oral tradition there's something that you can look at and so if you want so different people learn in different ways uh i like you know i learn best when someone shows me but i find that as a supplement mm -hmm. to remembering the techniques as to why the little um descriptions of things and it just creates it more of uh it's not just someone making it up and you know it's not mm -hmm. people with foam swords hitting each other isn't that's fun it's a lot of fun but there's there's more context there's a grounding in it and you feel more connected to the art because you know mm -hmm. it has that tradition and you can see that tradition yeah it's, it's fascinating i think it's like quite a common trend in martial arts with many martial arts that over time especially if it becomes more competition based um like I, I teach and train Wing Chun, and this I think it's still quite close to its roots, roots in um, application, and it really hasn't come become competition based. But one of the things is for me is like I want it to stay within its roots and not become too competition based because it is a different ball game, and you do have to change so much to make it fit in with that, and a lot of the kind of core aspects and roots of what an art is can easily get kind of um, lost over mm -hmm. time. So it's kind of it's kind of interesting, I think, even with what you're doing, it's was there a specific period that you feel that it changed a lot into more geared towards more competition? Um, as far as HEMA goes, mm. um, definitely, I would say competition in 2010s really became a highlighted thing. Um, if we're going back 10 years, even five years old, a lot of big things, a lot of big tournaments around the world. One's called Swordfish, for example. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's, so there's tournaments in across Europe, across the United States. And, you know, they, the, the clips end up on YouTube and people are earning medals. But once, when you, the problem is when you start to um, gamify, I guess, you have to have scoring, you have to have points. And the one thing they do, uh, a good tournament will do really well is they'll have multiple judges watching and then they'll consult the various judges, the referees to say, okay, what did you see? Did what's a point scored? They'll hold up and it's almost like a vote. So it kind of takes a little bit of, of that. Just, I just have to touch you and win. You get mm. more, some tournaments, you get more points if you have a better technique. And those are really good ones because then now they're actually watching. Did you control the opponent? Did you strike properly? Or did you just tag the opponent as best you could? You know, what's it all about? Just I threw my sword and ah, I hit you, so I get the point. Yeah. So there are there are variations in tournaments, and I think that now that we're getting past that initial frenzy of just you know people wanting to score points, now there mm -hmm. is that component of technique involved. So it is getting a lot closer, but you still have to have those safety factors in. But the one thing that HEMA can do that other things don't like um, in sport fencing, you just it's just the thrust, right? Whereas in HEMA, you could actually close for a grapple. You could actually punch someone if, if that's the technique that you ended up with. And there are those unarmored techniques. You could bind and disarm your opponent, move in, grapple. 
if you do those techniques, they're allowed. So the rules of what you can do are a lot more open now, which definitely means that you can find that grounding in the historical concepts and you can utilize them. Mm. Excellent, excellent. Can we have a look at some weapons? <laughs> yes. Do you want to know about a gladius? Yeah, definitely. Let's start there. Let's go back in time. Not the oldest form of sword, but there we go. Wow. This is a Pompeii I, pattern of gladius. I think the, the one thing that struck me when I, when I first saw it is I thought they would be bigger, like longer, but I guess because Romans... And when they were in their units, it was quite tightly packed. They needed kind yes. of, okay. So you have a large shield. In mm. Latin, that's called scutum. So you always just say scutum. And gladius just means sword. Mm. And so you'd have that. And because you're in press ranks with a big shield in front, it's easier to just do thrusts and cuts like that. And mm. you're really pressing the enemy. And that's the advantage. I mean, when you have thousands of troops and they all have their shields, and they just push in uh, anything, anyone with larger weapons that need more room to swing, they're spaced out more in their ranks or they're hitting their, their own soldiers. So mm -hmm. it's easier to move in and then use this for quick thrusts and cuts. And it does cut really well. A lot of people say, oh yeah, look, it's pointy and it's just for thrusting. But I, you know, we gather once here, we get pumpkins and cabbages and <laughs> water bottles and we, we, we cut things mm -hmm. and this, it's, it's sharp and it cuts just fine. So it is a very multi-purpose sword. It's very durable design, and it's but it's meant to be used with a shield, most definitely. Yeah. And that's mm. where it's most effective is in that big rank with those shields. Yeah, I can I can imagine it must have been pretty intense with a unit of sort of Romans plunging at mm. close range them into you. But that's what I was gonna ask as well because it doesn't have the guard. But no, I guess with the shield, the shield and you're fighting yeah. around the shield, moving the shield back in. So earlier swords don't have much handguard because mm. a lot of the times they are used with a shield. They're used in conjunction with something to defend yourself. And then you're attacking and then you step back and defend with the shield. Mm. Okay. So even, even with armor, the armor isn't, that, that plate armor development isn't going to happen until the 14th century. So okay. it's, as armor changes, swords change, and it is really connected. It is an arms race. Swords and armor are linked in their developments. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and also you were saying it can be held in your back, but it's not very well, practical. The, so. Only the body. Well, a lot of drawing a sword from your back is extremely difficult, but the one thing you can do is a gladius could be carried on your back. Not mm -hmm. that we have any evidence for that, but it's probably the only sword you can draw from your back in its actual scabbard. It was not worn that way. It was worn, you'd have a baldric across. Back a little bit. It would be held at the side. Okay. And you would draw it like right. that. All and right. that's how the Romans actually, how a legionary would have carried it, would have been at the right hip, the shield in the left hand, and then they would just draw it up. And it's short enough and easy enough that they could do that. Wow. Okay. Okay. Excellent. So, yeah, I'm interested to see what other swords you'd like to show and kind of get more of an idea of the difference, differences between them all due to the periods. Sure. And... Uh, let's oh. then move to something Viking. So we get a little bit of handguard, but not much. It's still a time of uh, using shields. And the shield is the main component. So when we look at Anglo-Saxon, Viking, and Germanic, the swords are getting longer. They're meant to deliver cuts, but you're still fighting around a shield. Okay. So you have a little bit more hand protection, but not much. The guard is a little bigger, but now we have much longer swords. And there were cavalry swords back in Roman times, call them spatha. And so there were longer bladed ones, but not meant for foot combat, but that, those designs translate into these uh, Germanic, Anglo-Saxon, Viking, Frankish swords meant not really for thrusting, definitely for cutting. Um, when you don't have the Roman Empire, you don't have big means of armor production and weapon production anymore. So you don't have a lot of armored people. The shield is most common, so you can hack into people. You're not worried about that. 
So we get these lovely cutting swords from, you know, the 6th century up until the 11th. As we get past that, there's a lot in the room here to look at. <laughs> As we get into medieval stuff, then we get the cross guard on the sword. And now we do have the hand protection. Shields are getting smaller. People are wearing chain mail, mail armor, and we have longer cross guards to protect the hand. You, it's not just about hand protection though, it also catches and manipulates the opposing blade. And so this is where we have manuals. We can see that if an opposing blade comes down, you can push, bind it to the side. And as we get to the 14th century, they become thinner and they become better at thrusting okay. with more male armor that people are wearing that chain mail. You need to be able to thrust into mm -hmm. it as well. And so now you're pairing it with a smaller shield or a buckler and you, we can see the techniques really develop for sword fighting and that's where we have the manuals start. So we have our first manual, um, it goes by a bunch of different names. We call it Walpurgis, we call it 133, we call it Tower Fight Book. Uh, it's a German manual that uh, talks about sword and buckler. It's from the early 14th century, 1320s somewhere. And it's really well detailed of the system. It's a specialty system, but it's the oldest that we have, actual mm -hmm. manual that talks about stuff. And so this is the type of sword that features in it. Mm -hmm. As we get to the 15th century, then we can talk about long swords. Wow, wow, wow. That's what I know best. That's where I started 10 years ago, learning long sword. So we have longer handles meant for two hands. We have armor, so we don't need shields anymore. Mm -hmm. Because if you've got plate armor on your arm, a shield is redundant. So now you can use two hands on the weapon. We end up with pole axes, we end up with spears, we end up with a lot more variety in weapons. And this is a sidearm, it's not a main weapon, okay. but so that's one thing is this is your this is kind of your backup or it's your traveling weapon. On a battlefield, you would probably use pole arms first, and then you could have this as your backup if something happened. But there's a lot of information on how to fight with long swords, and it goes into, it becomes almost like a sport in the late 16th century. Okay. It's not so much a battlefield weapon anymore. The sword changes. Ah. And you notice you get these little lugs, and you may have seen these on a lot of people, you know, in HEMA and long sword fights, you have these little lugs. Well, this is a 16th century invention for extra protection because people are now using this as a sport uh, i was gonna ask i was gonna ask because i saw them and i was like yeah. do you need do you need that extra no if you're if you were fighting on a battlefield in armor you wouldn't you wouldn't need these but when you're so when we get to the late 16th century so 1570s uh walk meyer we're looking at meyer it's spelled m-e-y-e-r and a lot of the swords have these little lugs, longer cross guards, and it's just extra protection mm -hmm. and extra maneuverability against the opposing blade because now we're looking at this more as a pastime. It's not as, it's not as great a use on the battlefield at that time. Um, we have firearms that have come into play. So mm -hmm. a lot of armor is just a heavier breastplate. You're not wearing as much armor on other parts of your body and so it's really a change in the dynamics of the battlefield. So this, so it, there's a sport version that goes back mm. 400 years. Wow, wow, it's pretty. That's pretty amazing yep. that they're already sort of adapting. But and then one of my favorite types of sword mm. is the Langsmesser. And yeah, now that is cool. <laughs> and this is a late late 15th century development and into the 16th century, and you can see hand protection starts getting better. So this is the nagel or the nail because it's nailed in to the guard mm -hmm. and it starts offering extra hand protection. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, but it's assembled like a knife and that's probably to get around guild rules of sword making. Um, oh, okay. You make the blade and you just, you know, put on a handle, rivet it on to the tang like it's a knife. Then you mm -hmm. don't have to get the pommel and you don't have to get the fancy cross guard. And so, and it's is a it long handle. handle. Is it easier to handle? Well, 
men, you wrestle and grapple with this. Okay. And so this allows you to hook the opposing opponent. Oh, right. So this is a whole different system of fighting. And it's not meant necessarily for the battlefield. There are hunting versions of the sword. But if you're fighting, this is more skirmishing, self-defense than what we see in all of the manuals associated with it. And you can actually grapple. So you can move around, bind the arm. Then your free hand comes into play. And you've got this on the elbow, this hooked onto the wrist. And you can push your opponent. And now you start to see the similarities in a lot of Eastern martial arts. So a lot of things that I studied before, when I look at Metzer, I'm like, oh yeah, well, that makes sense. Oh, I understand that move. Oh, that's a reaping move. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, you know, oh, that, you know, I'm like, oh, that, that's the crab from Jiu Jitsu where you kind of stand like all these moves and we can see them 500 years ago and they're used at the same time with sword in hand. So. Oh, okay. So, and and the, ri- the ridge on the end of the handle, is that, ju- is that the hook? It's here? Re- no, no, on the actual edge, uh, the bottom. Um, so that's that's mostly meant because knives have that, so oh, your hand can uh, yeah. the end. If you yeah. had a sword with a pommel, the pommel helps keep your hand from okay. sliding off. So that little ridge is just. I was thinking you might have techniques where you smash with the bottom bit, with the well, butt into the face. Kind of, but it's very smooth and very you slide off quite easily. Oh, okay. But so there's not a lot of, not as many pommel strikes as it would be with a big metal pommel. That we have mm-hmm. on uh, other swords. So, you know, on a medieval yeah, yeah. sword, if you have a much sturdier pommel, you could smash with that. And every part of the sword is a weapon. Mm-hmm. And the techniques often have, you know, you're using the pommel, you're using the guard, you're pressing the handle onto someone's throat. There's a lot that you do with a sword more than just cut with it. Yeah. It's, really, it's fascinating that there's a whole, and it's written down, that there's this whole mm-hmm. way to use a sword that's not very Hollywood. It's quite mean, actually. Yeah, I wanted to ask as well, actually, about um, the sort of more self-defense side. And I was thinking a lot of with the positions and stuff when you're holding the sword, do you also have draws that are or strikes that are just from hands down or random positions? Or is it all quite normally you take the on-guard position and then strike and defend from there? Or do you have it sort of random from any position you can strike from? Ah, fanta- fantastic question. So when we look at systems, there are some with a whole bunch of guard positions and some of them don't seem to make sense. Like, why would I start in this guard position? And you don't. So that whole, can I strike from a random position? It's actually built into the training. Mm. So if we were looking at certain long sword positions, for example, there are ones where the sword is held down low and you would think, well, that's an awkward place to start from. And, it's, and some of the, the guard positions are ones that you could end up in mid-fight. And so by practicing them, you know how to cut from, you know, an awkward position where your sword is off to the side. Well, why would I, why would I do that position to open a fight? You wouldn't. But then you would be there mid-fight. The opponent just retreats. You've missed. But now you know that you can then cut from or thrust from these positions. And so you could have 15, 16 guard, named guards in the system. That's a lot to remember. But it's all to help you so that in the middle of a fight, you remember your, your um, I don't want to call it muscle memory, so that your, your neurons just fire and you know exactly what to do mm-hmm. and perform the moves as needed. So that yeah. is built in to a lot of the systems. Which is, which is awesome. And I think that's how it should be. <laughs> you should have that sort of, okay, there is some clear structure to positions to take because when you first go into something, to learn something, you need some sort of clarity on what you're doing but ultimately you should be in any position and be able to kind of especially as a self-defense perspective Mm -hmm. strike from anywhere because you don't know where you're going to end up you don't know where you're going to be I guess um sort of from the self-defense perspective of getting into duels how formal was it you know like especially in medieval times would attacks kind of happen randomly or to be like me and you are going to duel and then you can get on guard, or would it just be like a it's bit both. more? <laughs> it's both. Um, there are formalized duels. There are duels to settle disputes where there's, you know, the law doesn't really have a clear understanding. So it could be over property, it could be over someone's border. You know, where's where's the border between our properties? And there's no legal, there's no record. There's 
like there are no maps and surveyors for example mm. so it's you know that oh well it was 16 paces oh no i thought it was only 15 paces and so mm. you know to know two people who were trained in swords you know more noble wealthy merchant types who had some leisure time to learn they could settle their dispute with a duel but there's also a lot of self-defense on the road you're traveling there's always banditry so you have a sword to carry and you would have those situations where you might fight one or even two or three people at once and you'd have to know some techniques and how to do that mm -hmm. or it could be drunken carousing in the streets and we know that um there are always good stories from london where they want to ban fencing schools because people learn how to fight and then you know groups of especially university students are wandering you know after they've done their classes for the day they go drinking and then they get into these fights and skirmishes in the streets so by banning the schools that teach how to fight oh, okay, okay. then they're trying to discourage you know people suddenly grabbing their swords and fighting and killing each other in the streets so you get those mm. little anecdotal tales as well wow it's, it's um it's, it's always it's always interesting seeing them different sort of aspects on how you're going to use and apply it and how much the times change and affect mm -hmm. what's going on and how when rules can come in come out and how everything even the clothes and everything change everything yeah the swords as well do you have any sort of multiple or double sword techniques or using dagger and sword together oh yes 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 uh, let's scoot back so particularly for the rapier um mm. you can use three rapiers um call it a case of rapiers because they two rapiers sit in a case and you open up and you fight with two rapiers but rapier and dagger is a lot of fun okay um there's also a rapier and cloak wrapped around your arm you use it kind of like a shield mm. uh, but rapier and dagger so there are a lot of paired weapons especially into the 16th and 17th century we start getting a lot of manuals and we've got these techniques of using either two swords or a sword and a dagger at the same time do you have a preference <laughs> <laughs> between using right. one or do you like using one sword or do you like using two do you like uh, having a I, I like Does using depending on the style uh i like using a sword and something different in my offhand I like options yeah, 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 two yeah. sword usually means one attacks one defends but if you have a dagger then you've got slightly different options so if a rapier is mostly for thrusting and a dagger can you can cut and thrust with this then you've got different options, different moves that you can do. And I always, I mean, the more options you have, the better the chance that you'll win in the fight. It's sort of like just using a medieval sword one-handed or having a buckler in the offhand. Well, you might as well have a buckler in the offhand because then you have options. Mm -hmm. If you have a wider repertoire of moves, then you have more chance of success in a fight against someone. That, that makes sense. I, I think I like... I like the idea of having a blade and a dagger as well. Just if someone gets close in, it's nice to have the dagger there. Exactly. And sometimes the range changes, the person rushes you, maybe they want to try grappling. Having something shorter allows you to get in. And you can punch with this, this yeah. sail dagger. You can okay. actually punch with it. So even if you had no range to cut or thrust with the dagger, you can still hit to knock the person back. So there's always options. And that's one thing that HEMA, looking at manuals, there's always some sort of option, no matter what the situation is. If you learn yeah. all the little extra details, that's not just sport fencing, I have to tag you with this sword in order to score a point. If you look at it more like self-defense, it really changes the dynamic of all the moves that you can have. It's almost like using the full capabilities of the art. Yes. Instead of limiting yourself, basically. I, I like, I really like that sale. <laughs> it's so cool. Yeah. Well, I, as I do a lot, you know, I mean, I study a lot of sword and buckler. So this is kind of half buckler, half dagger when you think about it. So it really does appeal to me. There are other ones with just little rings and guards, but I like the sail dagger. It really, it offers that good mix of protection and being able to have those options. And I mm -hmm. like options. Yeah. And, and also, you make scabbards? Um, I've made a few scabbards. Uh, the Messer, this is, 
this is my crowning glory here. So I made oh, wow, my own wow. tattered. That is pretty, pretty awesome. Yeah. So I do little bits of leatherworking for fun on the side and uh, that. How, how do you get it to fit right for the blade <sighs> after? <laughs> that is a lot of work. It's a lot of work and a lot of clamps. <laughs> A lot of glue and a lot of clamps. And so you build it, I built it like a box. I had some advice from an expert. Okay. And I hold it up so you can see that kind of mm, wet shape. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I yeah. Built, cut the pattern so that I had the bottom. I knew what it needed to be and I knew where the sides would be. And then built up the sides mm -hmm. and then had the top plate. And then when you go to glue everything together, so you t constantly test at each step have to make sure that everything fits and it's secure. And this one turned out really well because wow, it takes a lot for it to come out. So this, um, I made another one for the blunt version I have of this and it's not quite as tight, but still pretty good. But yeah, so it, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot of waiting for glue to dry. It's a lot of measuring. It's a lot of measure four times cut once because you need to really get it to be you really need to build it up the right way. So it's it is an art form. You can see why, you know, it's not it's not just a swordsmith who makes every single piece. A swordsmith makes the blade. Someone else makes the fittings. Someone else makes the scabbard. And it's a whole process of you know getting your sword. It's probably going to take five, maybe six different shops. Wow. In a town. Wow. And we're going to work on putting all those pieces together just so you can have it. So a sword really does become a prestige item. Mm. For those who have them, those who can afford them, those who are allowed to carry them. Yeah, it's it's actually interesting that I think a, a lot of people don't realize that even in in Wing Chun and martial arts like that, originally it was a lot of rich people that practiced martial arts because they had the time to. Whereas a lot of the lower classes, they didn't. They were actually just trying to, you know, survive, get food, and things like that. So they weren't training um, martial arts and things like that, they were actually doing that sort of stuff. So it puts things into context, like having a sword, like you're saying like that, it's like prestige, it's like you need, you need some money. <laughs> <laughs> you stuff. need money and time in order to learn this. So there is that kind of, we see that 14th, 15th, 16th century, that kind of rising merchant class, uh, they have that time. I mean, nobles of the time were expected, you know, the sons were expected to learn for war, the daughters, the probably pick up some things because they had the leisure time and would, you know, participate with their siblings. And we do have, we have examples of women. They're, they're kind, a lot of it kind of gets lost, but we're digging through those now and we're finding images. We get stories. Um, there are women who do go out and fight. They do lead, but they're all like noble, well-to-do ladies who get to do these things. So I can say, are there women who, who sort of fight in the past? A lot of them, but not one. I mean, I think Joan of Arc is really um, an exception to how it works, but that's the one everyone knows. Oh yeah, Joan of Arc, and she went off and you know fought for the French against the English. But there are a lot of other women that there are references to, but they tend to be higher status. They tend to have those times. They tend to have that authority to them where they can afford, you know, they can be afforded that uh, opportunity to lead soldiers into battle or to fight or to train. So yeah, it's definitely money and time. If you have that, yeah. you learn it. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting that there is always exceptions. Like I think that you can be in any position and if you really wanna make it work or really wanna learn something, you can. But it's also interesting that, yeah, a lot of the time um, it's people that can afford to have the time to train something, to put the necessary time into it, to get to a certain level as well and um, progress with it. Mm -hmm. So, Lauren, if someone came to your class, how would it work? What would they be? What if I was a beginner and I came to your class? What would my first introduction to it be? Oh, well, uh, if you show up to class, first thing you do is I, I'm going to greet you. Uh, so all the introduction students, I'm always happy, bubbly. I have a background in public relations and communication. So I just naturally uh, a good fit for me to do that. And the first thing I'm going to do is put a training sword into your hand. <laughs> um, polypropylene ones but I'm just going to give you a sword and just have go just just get used to it get used to the feel mm. play, play around with it 
you know, take a certain part in the gym or in the field that we're in and just, just, yeah, start playing with it and then, you know, get everyone set. And then once everyone is set, we do a basic introduction. And so we start people with long sword because it's, you learning a two-handed style is probably easiest. It's easier on the body, it's easier on the muscles. So we start people with long sword. We'll go over how to hold it. What are all the parts? So well, that's the pommel. That's what it does. It holds the sword together. It helps to, you know, for the balance. That's the cross guard. This is where you put one hand and the other. And so we just get everyone comfortable holding it. So there we go. You know, a little bit of space between your hand and the cross guard. Put this other hand. It works like a pivot, you know, it's push and pull. Then we teach them that, you know, what, how do you stand? How do you hold it? And we teach them one or two basic guards, you know, ones that you'd actually start a fight from. Where do your feet go? And we do footwork and then we start practicing cuts. And it's a slow evolution, but it's to make people feel comfortable. So that's not this big, scary thing. They want to learn sword fight. You know, you know, it's not like a whole bunch of okay, you need to do all of these warm-ups and skills and things before you ever touch a sword. No, grab the sword right away. That's why you're there. So we want you to have the sword in hand and get used to it. And we'll put all those other pieces together, but you've got your sword. And then you think, oh, that's cool. I get to hold the sword right away. <laughs> Absolutely you do, <laughs> right? And that's what keeps people in engaged. So you don't have that process of, okay, we're going to do push-ups and sit-ups. We don't do push-ups and sit-ups and things like that. Our warm-ups are all going to be with the sword. You know, we're going to do exercises with the sword in hand. The sword mm. is going to be your exercise tool because we want you to get used to it. So a lot of what we do, even warm-ups, are all sword-based. I mean, yeah. push-ups, push-ups and crunches and planks, they're great. Squats are important, but you can do them at home. When we're in class, we want to play with swords, so we play with swords. Yeah, and you're going to build the necessary strength for doing what you are doing as well. Exactly. Which I was going to say is. Well. Your forearms and your wrists, it must be quite intense. Yeah. <laughs> well, it can be. I mean, you've got three to four pounds that you're constantly moving as quickly as possible, really working with the sword. It really does. I mean, people often say, yeah, the next day after their first class, you know, you check in with them, and, you know, an email or through Facebook or whatever, and they're like, oh, my arms are so sore. And it's like, <laughs> you'll get to it. It's okay. Give it six months. And I can imagine as well for women developing arm strength, that's probably one of the key things they'd be looking for as well, really. Yes. And, um, you know, you, you want to get that strength in your wrists, in your forearms, in your elbows. That's a lot of the work is going to come from moving your arms and your elbows around with the sword. Okay. So there's a lot of that forearm development. So you, you do get, you do get nice, nice skinny, lean muscular forearms from it and do you have a lot of women in your classes uh in our advanced class we only have a few but uh our there's an intro that we started last year I mean, pandemic wise it's been really awkward we started we got four classes in everything shut down uh, we got okay. to go outside in the summer then everything got shut down and then we got to go inside for a couple classes everything shut down but um it's half women so if we had eight new students wow, okay. we brought, four of them were women. And That's one great. of them mom and her teenage son, uh, mm -hmm. for example. And they, you know, they do other martial arts, but they wanted to learn some sword fighting. So wow. great. You know, we've got some couples, we've got some, you know, friends. And so we're we can now go back outside. We're allowed to go train outside again. So okay. we've been starting bringing those people back to finish their uh, their program starting on the 17th. And it's just so yeah, so women like it, but it's, I think what it is is because there's so much about skill and, it's not, and speed rather than just brute strength to sword mm -hmm. fighting because there's all that technique and you do build some good strength that especially long sword is very appealing. And so it's not really a manly thing. It's anyone can learn it. And that's really how we teach it. I can see in your movement as well, you're connecting to your center and you're using that to guide the sword or work with yeah, the sword which i think definitely the whole body is in play so you start you know you make a little motion with your sword you start to move it but then your whole body is going to put that power so it is it's very much like any martial art where almost you imagine and the way it was taught to me doing jujitsu was 
it's like you're pulling the energy from the ground up your leg and into your body and well so it is that whole body mechanics your whole body is putting the sword so it's not just yeah, this yeah. like a movie it's very much movement and uh, it is a good workout too mm. i mean it's very very enjoyable the, the endorphins really kick in yeah yeah it's, it's, it's super cool i can imagine it's uh, very addictive <laughs> It is. Once you get in rhythm, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Lauren, great. Really enjoyed speaking to you. For our viewers, where can they find you? I know you've got YouTube, Instagram, Twitter. Where's the best yep. place for them to find well, you? Well, they can um, on YouTube. Uh, it's youtube.com slash C slash Lauren Danger Shaw. Mm -hmm. And on Twitter, it's just Lauren Danger. So at Lauren Danger on Twitter is the best place to find me. I post sword and cat photos because <laughs> there are cats that roam around the house, but you know, so like you'll get a few sword photos and links. If you're following me on Twitter, you'll get those links to the YouTube videos when they come out. Um, I try to do two weeks, but at least one week, a new video comes out on a new arms and armor topic. It could be HEMA instructional. It could just be more historical. Um, like I did one about studded leather. Does it work? And this type works and the other type where it's just random studs does not work. So, you know, there are also experiments that we do on the channel as well. So try to cover not just techniques. Some people just don't want to learn techniques, but they want to learn history. You get some of that as well. Mm, yeah, you're quite a diverse teacher, like I said at the beginning. So there's a lot to offer there. And obviously as well, I'm really enjoying your little poems at the beginning of all your videos. <laughs> <clears throat> well, everyone needs to have a little hook, a little something, you know, that makes their channel unique. And mm -hmm. so I just came up with, well, you know, I like rhyming. Uh, my niece and nephew always like when I do little rhymes for them. So I just decided to come up with uh, rhymes with them at the beginning. So if you get to be a challenge, you got to, oh, I got to think of a new rhyme. Oh, what am I going to do about it this time? And I can't repeat it, but it's still fun. Yeah, it's definitely fun. And um, yeah, it seems you, so it's, it's nice. It's nice. Mm -hmm. And last question, where did, yes. well, it might be quite obvious, but where did danger come from? Who gave you ah. that? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I say that as all the weapons are behind you, but. <laughs> <laughs> I used to be a safety instructor. Okay. It's part of my public relations type skills that led me into being a safety instructor. And I did a lot of kids um, electricity and utility and fire safety programs. And I was actually presenting. So a lot of my friends would joke that I was the danger lady because I went and I taught all the dangers to kids so to keep them to be safe. And so then I was joining Twitter and that was about 10 years ago. And, you know, everyone's, oh, you know, the you're the danger lady. You should be the danger lady on Twitter. And it's like, well, I still want to be part me. So I'll be Lauren Danger, you know, mm -hmm. and there we go. Um, Lauren Danger, the, the safety lady. And I'll, that's, that's what I'll be on Twitter for, for fun. And so Lauren Danger just kind of stuck as the name from there. So yeah, I used to be the danger lady teaching you about all the things that were dangerous. Wow. Now I am the one who's dangerous. How it changes. <laughs> <laughs> love it, love it. Well, I'm going to put all the um, links to your channels and Instagram, Twitter in the description. And I think I saw today as well, you have a masterclass coming out on the 13th on Sensei Emmett's yes. channel as well. Sensei Emmett, um, wonderful channel. Go follow Sensei Emmett as well. And follow, mm -hmm. make sure you follow Luke as well. Like, subscribe to him. <laughs> Let's go. Um, but yeah, he asked if I could do a little masterclass for the Female Warrior Week. And I was like, absolutely. So I have, I don't know. I don't know if he's done any editing to it. I recorded about 15 minutes worth of stuff. And it's just the basics of using a weapon, your breathing, your stance, you know, your body mechanics. So it's a little master class to, you know, for people who maybe they've been out of it for a while or they just want to practice on their own. They can get the basics down. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, doing that myself as well. I'll put a link in the description for that as well because it's already fantastic. Uh, the previews there, so you can go and check it out. But other than that, Lauren, really big thank you for coming on the channel. And I look forward to having you on here again at some point as well. Well, thank you for having me, Luke. I really appreciate it. This is a lot of fun. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks.